Hello and welcome to this BDA roundtable discussion focusing on learning disabilities and healthy weight management, which has been developed with support of the BDA Mental Health Specialist Group. My guest today will help us to explore a range of perspectives and to consider some of the challenges based on their knowledge, expertise and experience. I'm pleased to welcome Bryony Caffrey, highly specialist learning disabilities dietitian, a dietetic clinical lead and professional development officer for learning disabilities, Alex Larkin, a specialist dietitian for adults with a learning disability, and Rachel Colley, a specialist dietitian with experience of delivering weight management services in both mainstream and specialist settings. You can find more information and links in the comments section of this roundtable or by visiting us at www.bda.uk.com. And we'll start with Bryony. And Bryony, help us really to get some context around this subject. And the, the first question we want to explore is how important dietitians are in supporting informed and independent food choices for those with learning disabilities. Thanks, James. We know that people with learning disabilities experience greater health inequalities and greater um, problems accessing healthcare compared to the rest of the population. And this results in what we know is premature, avoidable and preventable deaths. People with learning disabilities die earlier than the rest of the population, typically between 23 and 20, 27 years earlier. We know that diet and lifestyle has um, an imperative role in our health and our well-being. The Mental Capacity Act tells us that we need to assume somebody has capacity. Um, and when it comes to food choice, it's very easy for people to understand that in terms of what someone's preferences are might be in terms of whether they would like this food or that food. But it's kind of more extended than that in that people need to be able to make informed choices and know that that choice has a consequence for their health. So the question isn't purely based on um, what food they like, but also whether they can understand that relationship between diet and weight and health and whether then they can apply that information to themselves. So a lot of the time we find that because the care providers are taking an approach with the clients that they're supporting to make sure that they are making independent choices, that probably isn't explored fully in terms of those choices being well informed. And there is, um, there's limited information out there that makes that can inform their decision using accessible information also we end up showing love through food and we use food for many other reasons other than just nutrition and those factors can also exacerbate obesity in somebody when our, our social events all of our activities of meaningful engagement are all food based um, and ways to kind of engage someone. All of that, again, has a knock-on impact onto somebody's weight. Well, there can be a lot of work to be done around engaging the client in using accessible information to inform their food choices and the consequences that might have on their health, as well as informing the, the staff team and the family members around the person and thinking about, like I say, not just the meals and the nutrition, but the, the meaningful activities throughout that person's day. And then I suppose the, the care sector at large, you know, has responsibilities in terms of identifying, monitoring and, and providing effective interventions in managing that way. But I suppose also just to think about how we offer those food choices. And it's really important that we work with people in, with a rights based approach and including autonomy and choice for people so that they can exercise their agency, but that those choices that they're offered, you know, reflect what we know about balanced eating and the eat well guide. So it's not about taking choice away, but ensuring that those choices are supportive of health and weight. Also thinking about capacity, we need to be acting in a person's best interest if they don't have um, capacity. And again, that just comes down to ensuring that those choices that are available are from a balanced diet, reflect a balanced diet. So we also want to make sure that we're doing good and we're not doing any harm for people. So this is kind of the, the framework around the rights-based approach. What I hear quite a lot is that care providers can be scared about depriving somebody of their liberty 
the flip side of that is that often people are deprived of the health that they can have. What we need to be doing in terms of best practice is doing capacity assessments with people, checking that they can make decisions relating to balanced eating, ensure that they are given opportunities to understand with accessible information what balanced eating is and the impact that it has on health, ensuring that we're working with people in an empowered and respectful way and checking their understanding of the relationship between diet, weight and health. What we frequently find is that people with learning disabilities are unable to accurately identify their own weight when given pictures of different body sizes. So they can often understand that there are some foods which are good or bad or healthy or unhealthy and they could identify different meals and activities that might support them to lose weight but frequently they are unable to identify their own body weight as being a risk therefore they are unable to weigh up all of the information that is necessary to make informed choices around balanced eating so after we've had a we've completed the capacity assessment that explores the relationship between diet weight and health and their understanding and if that evidence is that they don't have understanding and they don't have capacity then we need to have a best interest meeting with all members of that person's care team and their family involved. And that would typically include a social worker, uh, potentially an advocate, to look at uh, the menu planning, the food access, trips out, family visits, all aspects of that person's living to think about how we can be making changes that are still empowering and compassionate to the person that means that we're improving the quality of their diet and therefore influencing the health outcomes that they're going to be experiencing. Okay, let's come to Alex now. And Alex, let's talk about, I suppose, the role of the dietitian really. And how do you think dietitians have helped that transition from perhaps what we might see as a more traditional care setting to, I suppose, more commonplace those within the community? Well, this, I'm, I'm not sure I'm best placed to comment on on. Um... That transition from more institutionalized care, the traditional care setting for people with a learning disability, because that transition happened a little bit before my time working within dietetics. But, you know, what we do have now um, is more care within the community. So a lot of people with learning disabilities will live in small care homes which are specifically designed to meet the, the needs of someone with a learning disability or within supported living within the community or domiciliary care within the community and I think we need to look at dietetics being an integral part of that that care support system um, and for dietitians to have maybe a more hands-on role with care working with care providers to ensure that the, the quality of the, of the diets and the nutrition that they're providing meet national recommendations. So things like the Eat Well Guide, making sure that they're in line with those. I suppose in the past, when people were, were living in institutionalized care, their access to food and their diets were a lot more restrictive. And when, when that change was happening from institutionalized care to care within the community, there was a real focus on people having more independence and more choice and quite rightly but as Brian has said we need to make sure that that when it comes to food that that choice is supported to be um, a healthy choice um, and that we need to look at somebody's capacity to make informed choices around their uh, their diet and their nutrition. So I think really dietitians need to engage with CQC as well um, who would be monitoring care providers um, and we need to work together to agree on you know what the, the standards are that we're looking at um, I think often when care providers are inspected regarding nutrition they're looking at food safety standards whereas dietitians will be looking at making sure uh, the diet that's provided is in line with the eat well guide or it's meeting individuals um, specific nutritional needs and i think what we need to remember is that the care providers those you know managers and, and carers that are working working in the care sector are not specifically trained in nutrition and they have such a huge role to support somebody with all of their their physical 
health needs and their mental health needs. And I think they can't be expected to be experts in nutrition. And that's what we're there for. So I think it's really important that we have a very active role um, working alongside care providers to support them with with meeting what can be very complex nutritional needs for somebody with a learning disability. So Rachel, thinking about working culture and uh, and that approach to to work, how do you think that perhaps some of those specialist services could be more aligned to some of the core provision? I think it ties in with the sort of oft asked question, you know, where should someone with a learning disability or how should they be supported to lose weight? Should it be within uh, a specialist service, a learning disability service, or should it be in a mainstream dietetic service? When we look at this whole thing, we need to think, what what are we actually trying to do? And at the end of the day, we are weight management in general. I mean, this is a, a very generalized statement, but we are trying to help people move a bit more, hopefully, and eat differently, whether that means eating less or eating slightly different foods. We are trying to help people change what they do so that they feel motivated to uh, try changes and keep keep them going and that's it but obviously (laughs) it's so much more than that and I think when you're looking about which service should support someone with a learning disability I think you you need to think about what uh, support do they need to support them to to do these things and and what extra needs does someone with a learning disability present bearing in mind that everyone is unique you know everyone presents in different ways so i I think the question is when when we're thinking about uh, you know working culture when we're thinking about approach when we're thinking about who should provide uh, a weight management service for people with learning disabilities i think it's really helpful to think about what um, what is maybe slightly different for someone with a learning disability when you're looking at how to help them eat a bit differently and move a bit more. So off, often I hear, um, a white, well, someone should be able to attend, say, a walking session. You know, often I think mainstream services and there are some brilliant services and there's brilliant activity opportunities. And people think, OK, well, we've, we've done that. So maybe councils think, well, we've, we've offered that. So I, I worked in Swindon and there were some brilliant services available for, for example, specialist cycling sessions. Uh, fantastic. So I think, you know, the um, services would think, right, we've got uh, we've got the service available. But what is often, I think, forgotten <laughs> is someone with a learning disability will need probably need support to get to that session. So they will either need someone to perhaps drive them. They may need someone, say, say they're able to go, go on the bus to, to that place. They, they generally need support to, to know which bus to get on, uh, where to get off, and possibly sort of training some, sometimes to be able to you know, safely and reliably get on the right bus at the right time in the right place and get off uh, the bus. Sometimes there's a bit of a walk between the bus stop and where the session is taking place. You you need to think about these things in, in terms of thinking what extra support does someone need to attend sessions. Thinking about support that's required is, is helpful in terms of thinking who needs to provide that support. So, for example, I know Bryony has talked about capacity and capacity assessments, but when we're thinking which members of a team need to help, obviously specialist dietitians are great, but actually we might need a speech and language therapists to help us with that, to help us understand how best ways of communicating with that particular person what level of understanding does the person have in terms of can they understand a written word or a pictures okay or actually is a real photo of real things the best way to communicate with that particular person because everyone you know is is, is unique and different Yeah, I was just thinking about what you were saying and kind of thinking about that in terms of the systemic approach, which is needed to be effective with the learning disability population, because we can't just work with the client themselves, Mm. whether that person has capacity or not. 
um, mm. we need to take that kind of broader approach and just building on the multidisciplinary team mm. and the role of the different people there. You know, the speech and language therapists are there to kind of support the, the capacity assessment and mm. also to help us communicate any changes that is needed for that person. Um, and yeah. supporting that person to kind of still be at the centre of the changes that might be happening for them. Even if they are deemed not to have capacity, we still need to be working with them. And so speech and language therapists might be integral to that piece of work. Mm. Also thinking, you know, broader in terms of the role of physios, in terms of any physical activity mm. or occupational therapists, in terms of meaningful engagement in non-food related activities. The role of, um, as you say, psychology in, again, like supporting any changes and understanding the presentations that that person might be having around food. Um, mm. The role of all the different types of um, medication that somebody might be on and whether psychiatry or the GP is able to review those meds and think if there's one that might um, be a little bit more supportive to weight management. So yeah I just wanted to build on the the kind of the need for that um, systemic and broad approach and again the, the role of the dietitian in terms of supporting the client themselves but also the, the staff team and the family members and, and perhaps even, you know, other members in the health and social care team there in what the nutritional needs are for the client. OK, just a final question now for the panel to consider. Alex, what kind of steps, sort of next measures do you think we can put in place in terms of supporting perhaps more effective weight management services for learning disabilities population? Well, I think it's vital that we develop specialist weight management programs for people with learning disabilities. Um, and I think we need to look at that on a more national level. Certainly there are individual teams in, you know, individual trusts around the country who have developed their own weight management pathways and maybe have run pilot weight management groups and that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's important that we we have this conversation on a national level and agree a strategy because we know from the research that just adapting a mainstream weight management program um, and making you know, a few tweaks here and there to accommodate people with a learning disability really doesn't work for our population group. Um, that isn't how they achieve the best results. We need to start from scratch and build weight management programs, um, weight management pathways for people with learning disabilities that are bespoke for, for this population group and really take into consideration all of the things that Bryony and Rachel have mentioned, the, you know, the, the specialist considerations that we need to make for this population group. So I think that's something that we need to, to look at as dietitians and more generally in terms of healthcare provision. Rachel, let's bring you in there. Thank you. I mean, I think answering the question, my big thing would actually be to say that carers, we are asking an awful lot of from them. Uh, they need to be and can be very skilled workers and I think they need to be paid as such and need to receive training that in, in this area that we are very um, capable and keen to support them with but I think their, their role is absolutely key. Bryony let's come to you finally. Thank you. I think um, for me, it's clear that the learning disability dietitians are very well placed to be supporting the client, the carers, the family and the systems to improve weight management services, reduce the health inequalities associated with obesity. And I think in the longer term, we need to be, you know, working, as Alex said, with CQC, working with the care sector, more integrated, ensuring that we've got more dietitians within community adult learning disabilities teams and, and looking to develop these services so that they, they're effective and, and person centred. Well, that's all we have time for now. My thanks to our panel, Bryony, Alex and Rachel. For more information on this topic and the work of our specialist groups, you can visit www.bda.uk.com. Thanks for listening.